Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. Good morning, Rabbi. This week, we have the privilege of studying the uh, Torah for Parshat uh, Shmini. We will have read Shmini, I think, five times over uh, in preparation for, for this Shabbat. Not the most we've ever read it. There are, many, there are some sh years where we read Shmini, Shmini eight times, Shmini, Shmini. But that is not, not the case this year. Um, and Haftorah this week is from the book of Shmuel. Shmuel Bet uh, begins in chapter 6. Uh, and uh, us Ashkenazim carry it all the way through the end of chapter uh, 7, verse uh, uh, 16, 17. Um, and there are really a, 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 a few distinct units of this. It's one of those situations where our Haftorah is significantly longer than the uh than, than our Spartic compadres um it uh you know we've been looking at a number of different half Torah, in particular we've been looking often at Nevi'im Achronim the later prophets uh which we talked about isn't necessarily a uh, historical designation but more of a content designation I mean that's really what we see here this is a Nevi'im Rishonim this is classical what you would expect from that, this is a narrative. There's a story here that we're going to read. Um, and there's prophecy inter interlaced, but it's really a story. Um, and uh, the story is uh, a, rather, a rather famous one. Begins where King David is, decides to bring back the Aron uh, to, to, to Jerusalem from where it's been resting. Um, where has it been resting? Shiloh. Where? Shiloh. No, it's not in Shiloh. It gets captured, if you recall. It was in Shiloh at one point. It gets captured by the Plishtim. The Plishtim are not happy with it because it causes them to not be well. And so they send it away. And it gets through various whatever. Eventually, it is. Um, it gets to Beit Avi Nadav. Um, and he watches it for uh, several years. Um, and then the Haftor describes the procession uh, up to Yushalayim and the whole process of which that is. Um, and uh, unfortunately is marred. The procession is marred by Uzziah puts out, I'm sorry, Uzzah puts out his hand. Uzzah is one most, you know, uh, uh, Uzzah, we'll, we'll get to who he is in a second, puts out his hand. He ends up getting killed um, for, for putting out his hand to essentially catch the, uh, the Aron. Um, and the whole, the whole thing gets, uh, gets, gets stopped. And, uh, you know, King David is all nervous and, and afraid. And so they leave the Aron in, uh, in Beit Oved Edom, um, and uh, for three months, and they see that the the house, his household is blessed, uh, you know, uh, uh, is blessed. And King David realizes that the uh, Aron is not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, a dangerous object like that. They can also bring brachot. Uh, it can bring blessings. So they start again this process. And this time, every six paces, every six steps that they take, they bring a they bring sacrifices to God. And David dances, you know, exaltedly before the Arod, um, and uh, and uh, and uh, and brings it brings the Arod to uh, to Yerushalayim, um, and uh, and everyone has a great party. That's where the uh, Haftorah for uh, this week ends for Svardim. Um, we continue with two more legs of the narrative. Uh, the first is that David's wife, who is uh, the daughter of Shaul, Michal, sees David dancing like up a storm in front of the Aron and is uh, upset, is, uh, uh, as the translation writes, she's contemptuous um, of him doing that um, and tells him off for it. And David has no, has no, uh, no place for that and basically tells her off uh, in addition um, and basically uses this as a uh, uh, point of contrast between his dynasty and the, 
and the uh, and and her father's, um, and she actually has no child. Uh, the Navi tells us, and then the last part, the last seventeen verses, is the story of King David wanting to rebuild or begin the building of the temple, um, and uh, Nathan telling David not to do that; that there needs to be peace first, um, and that uh, eventually it will be built, but not, but not yet. Um, and what's really interesting, and we could, each of these are obviously topics we could spend the entire time thinking about. Um, Right off the bat, if we think about our Parsha, right, this connects to our Parsha for what main reason? Our Parsha is about the eighth day of, uh, of, of the inauguration of the temple. Um, and what happens on this, on this, in the moment of this uh, celebration, what happens? The Nadav and Avihu. No, the, the Nadav and Avihu, as as uh, Cindy just mentioned, we have a story that unfolds of Nadav and Avihu, two of our own sons, who brings a foreign fire. What exactly they did wrong, we'll actually think about it a little bit together. But they they, they bring a foreign fire, um, and they uh, and they um, and they're killed. Um, and really, that seems to be a very clear connection between our Torah and the Parsha. Right, both of them are stories of moments of inauguration of great celebration, which are marred by the death of major characters in the story for transgressing, seemingly transgressing on the sanctity of God. Right, that's that's a big picture comparison. Um, and the question we will think about today, uh, in addition to the story that we're going to look at, um, one of the questions which we might not answer is at least for us Ashkenazim, the first part of the story makes total sense, right? All of this is the self-contained story of, of inaugurating the Aron, of uh, bringing the Aron back to Yerushalayim. Uh, it, it gets stopped because of this death, but the show must go on at some point, unlike in the Torah, on the Yom HaShmini, on the eighth day, when uh, Nadav and Avihu are killed, Moshe says right away the festivities need to continue. They need to do everything. David, in this situation, pauses. There's a three-month hold where David sort of reassesses. But even in the story, after that three months, we get to the conclusion where the Aron makes it to Yerushalayim. The question that as Ashkenazim, we, we are left to, to ponder is what does these additional stories that I just mentioned, the story of the engagement, the encounter with um, Michal in the chapter, in verse 20 of 23 with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the daughter of Shaul, with Michal, what does that add to our story and to the m m message and the motif? And what does the whole story about building the Beit HaMikdash uh, have to do to fit into the story? Um, obviously, they're nice stories, but they don't seem to be connected per se. Why do we have that? Why don't we just you know, settle like the Swartim? A very technical answer could be we're very worried about the 21 verse rule and our story ends at 19 verses. If we add three more verses if we add three more verses to finish the next section and then have 23 verses, that's all a very negative encounter. So we go a little further, we're not going to stop in the middle of the story. We're going to contain the continue and, and, and close the entire rest of the story. Um, and therefore, that's how we get such an elongated Haftorah. If we take it on a very technical level, if that's what's happening, so then the role of David's dynasty and the encounter with Michal is irrelevant to our story. Uh, and the message and the building of the Mishkan is just a nice ad addendum because we need to fill our verse count. That's one way of looking at it. I'm not as inclined to do that, but, uh, but, but that might be a very simple answer. It's something just to think about. But let's focus on the first story. And I, I really actually meant to start with this question, but I want to start with this question and hopefully you'll erase what we've learned so far about the story. Uh, and Renana will be our guinea pig because she will have just come in now. Yeah. Yeah. We, if you see in shul, if you've been in shul, and hopefully everyone, as they get vaccinated, should be able to come back when they when they're comfortable, um, and we should be able to dive in again soon. You'll see we don't do hagba and galila, right? We don't do hagba and galila. One of the reasons is, um, for a very simple consideration, I've heard from a number of shuls that Torahs have either fallen or ripped um, doing that because, as opposed to in every other time. Um, when you have two Gabayim standing right there in arm's length of a Torah, you know, a Torah won't roll off a table or something like that because there are two people there and they're able to quickly catch anything. And if you actually look 
if you remember back, back to the, before the world turned upside down, there was one or two times, you know, a month when a Gabai would step in to help with a Hagba or to hold the Torah for Galila. Like they, it, it happened. It, having six feet means that you're, you're two seconds away and those two seconds could be very precious. Um, and it's not worth risking a Torah, right? That's, that's, that was part of our logic for what we are practice currently. And the reason I asked this question is if you saw someone carrying a Torah and it started to fall, what would you do? Catch it. Right. Catch it. Right. You'd stick out your hands, right? Right, yeah. You'd stick out your hands. Basically catch it, yeah. Right, right. I think all of us would do that. And so what I want to think about as we talk about our Torah and focus on the first part of our Torah, which is really the connection, is, is this, this story, which at the core is the death of someone, of Uzzah, of, of Uzzah. What does Uzzah do? What's his sin? So if you look at uh, verse uh, number six, I'm just going to read it in English. They vayav, or I'll read it in Hebrew and then in English. By a, uh, where am I? By David. So they're coming up from they're coming up from this place, um, and they get Adgoren Nachon by Shlach Uza El Aron Halohim. He puts out his hands and he grabs it. And if you look at the last uh, three words of this verse, why? Because the oxen had shifted it, meaning the Aron starts to slip. And Uzzah sticks his hand out to make sure the arm doesn't fall off the wagon of oxen, uh, the wagon drawn by oxen uh, to Yerushalayim. So he does that. Um, so what happens? Verse number, verse number seven. Vayichar af Hashem be'uzah. God's wrath flares against Uzzah. And God smites Uzzah there. Um, Vayama Shami dies there in Aaron Hailohim with the uh, with the Ark of God. Vayichala David. David is nervous, al or and 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 upset and 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 anxious and 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 despondent. Allah share parat Hashem peretz beuza um, and uh, calls because God uh, uh, shot out you know, made a breach and killed Uzzah in that moment. And they call that place Peretz Uzzah. Adi Yomazet, until this day, right? This is, think about the road up to, from Beit Shemesh to Yerushalayim. That's what we're talking about here, right? They're coming up from Beit Shemesh to Jerusalem. They're on the road. It's a rocky road. The, the oxen shift. They hit a little bump. The Aron shifts in the back of the uh, wagon. Uzzah is walking alongside it, for, probably for an honor guard. Uzzah and his brother, um, who we who we uh, who we read about uh, in verse number seven, in verse number three, excuse me, that I wrote that they send a new wagon and everything to, to the house to bring Mibet Avi Nadav from the house of Ami Nadav, um, and he has two brothers, Uzzah and um, Uzzah and Ahio are there walking. They have like an honor guard next to the Aron. They're accompanying the Aron um, as they walk. And Uzzah sees this happen and reaches out and he gets killed, right? So just like there's, there's, there's a fascinating comparison, right? We, we talked about why is this have Torah chosen, right? It's clear at face value that the Torah is connected. Two brothers and two brothers uh, at a day of celebration, uh, they get the, the, the joy is, is marred by this moment that seems like there's a transgression against God. I know my shoulder's going in and out. I hope it's not too, uh, too disturbing with this virtual background. Um, I could go back to, I could go back, magically transport back to my office. It's fine. Poof. Um, right? So, uh, you'll, you'll, excuse, you'll excuse the mess. Um, so magically gets transported back to, uh, or uh, uh, we have this comparison between these two stories. These two brothers. It's interesting. Even what are Aaron's children's names? Nadav and Avihu. What is the house where Uzzah comes from? Avi Nadav, Nadav, Avihu, Avi Nadav. So even like the names are sort of like are parallel each other. We have this combination. Uh, these two brothers. They set off. 
Um, and, and the truth is that they both are we're perplexed by what exactly goes wrong. What, does, what happens with Nadav Avihu? The rabbis struggle, right? Uh, the Gemara and the Midrash can, can list, you know, no less than 15 things that, that, that Nadav Avihu did wrong. Um, and when you can list no less than 15 things, it means that no one's really sure what they did wrong. So we have to list a lot of things. Right, I, I can list. You know, I have uh, the Medrash, uh, the Medrash Rabbah, Bayikra Rabbah, which is uh, you know a midrash, but also a very old midrash. It's actually um, it's one of these things that when you read midrashim, there are certain key words that tell you a lot about the history of the midrash. So the midrash in Bayikra Rabbah, which is on Achrimot, but really talking about our parsha, writes Tani uh, Debe Rav Lazer, Rabbi uh, Rabbi Aliezer, right? But it doesn't have an Aleph for Eliezer, right? It just has Liezer, right? That is a, that is a telltale sign uh, for anyone who's doing Dafyomi. They'll see the Yerushalmi, Jerusalem text, often leave out those Aleph, right? It's not Rabbi, uh, it's not Rav Abba, it's Rav Ba, right? We leave out those Aleph often. Um, it's just the, the style, the orthography, the language that happens in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and so we can actually date parts of Vayikra uh, Rabbah all the way back to a Jerusalem composition, which means it's a very old, old Midrash. Um, you know, that, that is probably concurrent uh, maybe with the, with, with, with the Mishnah um, or even with, uh, or at least the Yerushalmi. Uh, so we know it's a very old Midrash. Um, and it tells us that there are different things that they did, that they were, uh, that they were more hara, that they, uh, that they, they taught a halacha before Moshe and they weren't allowed to, or that they, um, or that they brought uh, uh, korbanot uh, the wrong way, or they came close to the Mizbeach the wrong way, or they brought an Ishtara, they brought a foreign fire that wasn't the right type of fire they were supposed to bring, or um, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't lo not lu eitza zemiza, they didn't take advice from one another. They didn't treat each other properly, or they're stuyayin, or they were drinking, um, or they're mechusar begadim. They weren't wearing all the right clothing for the kohen gadol, or they didn't wash their hands properly, or um, they uh, they didn't have children. They decided that they they, they weren't going to have families, or that they weren't married, or that they. Uh, they were, they mocked their elders. They said, you know, how long is it going to be for these old people, Moshe and Aaron, until we get in, until we're in charge, um, or that they approach the Shekhinah inappropriately. Um, but either way, in all of these scenarios, right, we're not really sure what they did wrong. And so we have all these different lists that we try to piece together. Um, and as baffled as the rabbis are about what Nazav Avihu did, it's much harder to try to figure out what uh, Uzzah did in this situation, and right, what, what did he do wrong? So I want to I want to give I, I I've been thinking about this. I don't have great answers for this question, but I'm going to give you all the answers I put together, uh, and some of them you might like, and some of them you, you some of them are more technical, some of them are more global meta, and one is a fascinating one which I only heard this week in preparing this class. Uh, it's very uh, uh, modern is like a derogatory thing, but it's very clever. Um, and it's, it's a modern reading by a rabbi in, uh, in Manhattan, um, who, I, who, I, uh, who I was reading some of his materials and I came across. So what did Uzzah do, right? That's, that's one of our questions. What did Uzzah do? How do we understand the soft Torah? What did Uzzah do? So on a very broad level, one of the approaches is to follow the line of Nadav Avihu. Nadav Avihu entered into God uh, inappropriately, nonchalantly. They didn't have the right level of fear before uh, Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that there's this paradox that the Haftorah is trying to drive home to us is that as much as we try to come close to God, we need to make sure we recognize that there's this chasm, this gap between us and God, between the infinite and the finite, and that we need to always mind the gap. And if you get too close, right, God is an ish ochelet, God is an all-encompassing fire, and that every action needs to be tempered with that distance, with that awe, with that reverence. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an idea that's predicated in, in uh, the foundation for a lot of different Musar type of works, that we always have to live with a certain amount of fear in us. Right? We say, if do us Hashem b'semcha, right? you should serve God with, uh, uh, with, with joy. Um, but we also say in Tehillim, if do us Hashem b'yira, right? We should, you should serve God with fear. And that, that needs to come together. The Rambam actually has a whole interesting matrix where fear and love come together, that your love of God and understanding of God relates to the fact that you now understand how awesome God is, and therefore that increases the fear, right? That there needs to be this, 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 this bringing together. That none of you sins was that they were too comfortable, that they were too, that they, you know, everyone, where was Moshe and Aaron as none of you sins? Where's Moshe and Aaron when none of you sins? Pay, you'll pay attention to Turing this week. Where is he? They are prostrated, right? Aaron blesses the people. They bow down. Everyone bows down as the Shekhinah comes. And everyone is, you know, falls before God and is essentially in a trance before God. And none of you are like, this is no big deal, right? We're Kohanim. We see it all the time. We were on Harsinai. We've had these experiences. So they go and push further. I mean, they, they didn't appreciate. There's a certain either too much familiarity about what's going on. They didn't appreciate the, uh, the, the, the challenge here about what, what's happening here. Um, and that might be the issue with Uzzah as well. Uh, Uzzah, it lives with the Aron, right? He grows up seeing the Aron in his home for, for, for decades. Um, and as he's walking to the Aron, as he's walking along the Aron, he sees the Aron shift and he decides to just grab it, right? It's too familiar to him. Um, and that, that, that might, be, might, might be part of the problem. The Yushami has a fascinating uh, interpretation, which might attach to this, but it's also very particular, that Uzzah needs to use the restroom. And the Aron was just the box. And uh, so he relieves himself on the procession on the way up to, uh, to, to this thing. And that's why he gets smart, right? But how could he do that, right? Well, if the Aron was is presumably boxed in somewhere, Right, wasn't just exposed to all the elements. It was boxed in in his house. He grew up in his whole life, so he does the same thing when he wins on this procession. Right, it's a crazy thing to think about. I see Renana, you're muted. I can't hear you, but I see your facial expressions. Right. Uh, I mean, that to me just seems so absurd because there's nothing to lead us to understand that that would have been the case. I without just a doubt, that. without a doubt, which is oh, what I'm telling you, I'm, which I'm telling you from the outset is I don't have a great answer to this question, but that's what the Ushami seems to say. The, another, another sort of answers here is um, based on the Bavli, the Jerusalem, the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud in the Gemara and Sota recalls a fascinating story. Um, and it's hard to understand all together, but David calls, in Tehillim, Kuf Yud Tet, Divre Torah Zmiro calls them these just these songs, right? We say Zmiro, Zmiro means, you know, Shabbat songs, but Zmiro, there are songs colloquially. So the Gemara says, Amar Lo Kashbrahu, God said, Davar Torah Shekasa Bahem, that, that the, the, the words of Torah that says that you should be you know, totally in grace, in, you know, that you should fear God, that you should, that's these strong words. Atta Koreo Tans Miro, you call them just like songs. They're not songs, right? There's so much more than songs. That's derogatory. Hareini, I'm going to put before you, I'm going to make you forget even something, a few Tinok shell baked Rabban, even a little kid in school that will have known, had any type of Jewish education will know, you'll forget. Um, uh, and what is it? The Gemara says, Dixiv, as it's written, Uvnei Kahat Lo Natan. If you remember in Naso, uh, when we talk about, div- I think it's Naso, we talk about dividing up the uh, wagons for the work of the Levium to carry the Aron. The children of Kahat don't get a wagon. Why? Ki Avodat HaKodesh, because their, uh, their, their, their job is to carry the actual Aron. Um, but if you so on their shoulder, they should carry it or it should carry them. So what, what was the problem? He put them on a golo. He put them on wagons. How should the Aron have been carried? It should have been carried by people. And David said, put them on wagons. And so that was the mistake here. 
that there's this, this issue they put on wagons. The Radak does not like this at all. The Radak doesn't like this at all because the Radak says, uh, and, 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 the, and the Barbanel, maybe that was just what they did in the desert. Whoever said forever and ever the Aro needs to be carried on wagons. And maybe, maybe, you know, that's when they go a short distance. You know, when you honor, when they do like a Hachnas the Sefer Torah, they welcome a new Torah. So you have like five different people carrying it for a couple steps. But, you know, to have the, someone carry the Aron all the way from Beit Shemesh, all the way up to Jerusalem, that's a Gazenta hike, right? I took, I took a Malyan Kalamoid on, uh, to the uh, Hube Line Tower, right? It's a nice hike for a four-year-old, right? It's a nice hike for a 32-year-old, right? Um, it's a nice hike. So to carry the Aron that whole way, it would have taken a team of Levium to constantly changing and this and that. That wouldn't have been respectful. So they put it in, who says that that has to be the case? So Radak is very uncomfortable with this, with this approach. Rashi in our, in our Haftorah points out that Uzzah should have known that uh, the, the, the Midrash says, so on their shoulders, it should carry them, meaning they should carry the Aron, but the Midrash says that it carried the people, right? The Aron carried the people that carried it, right? And that's how it carried the Kohanim across. If you follow, the, if you read through the story of, of crossing the Jordan River, there's a question about when the Kohanim crossed. And one of the answers for that is that the uh, Aron sort of crossed them over the river, right? That the Aron carried them. So Rashi says, Uzzah should have known this. And when the Aron shifted, he should have known that the Aron wouldn't have fallen, right? But even that, and that's where I asked this question at the beginning, it's human nature. You see something falling, particularly something of immense value, to grab it and to, to try to save it, like Uzzah's being killed because he has the right instincts. Like it's, it's very hard to understand. It's a reflex, and it's a good reflex, right? This is something that's really important. It's a good reflex, right? So what's going on here? And if you want to say it's David's mistake, so why is why isn't Uzzah getting killed? Uzzah didn't say put it in the wagon, right? Who doesn't say put in the wagon? Um, if you look in Divrei Yamin, which also recalls the story, so they actually talk more about David's role in this and his culpability, but also Uza still is given a certain culpability for it. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard to understand. So, so far we've seen, they're too familiar with it. Yeah. I just wanted to, just modifying this one slightly, I mean, it doesn't exactly say who it was that actually put it in the wagon. You know, I don't know if uh, they were Kohanim or if the who of Uzia was a Kohen, but it could be that he was careless in the way that it was put in the wagon to allow it to even shift in the first place, and that's what he did wrong. Interesting. It's possible, but only only Uzza was. No one else was involved in the putting in the wagon. It could have been he was the one in charge and he was the one who was supposed to make sure that it was securely in the wagon. Um, it's just a su supposition. I'm just proposing. That it, se it seems like that he reaches out to grab it. That seems to be, if you look in verse number six, that seems to be the case. So let's just review, let's just review what we see so far. Number one, if maybe they were too familiar, right? That there needs to be, and the message of the soft Torah is about maintaining this distance, this recognizing this constant, we try to get close to God, but we have to recognize that there's that challenge that, that we, that, you know, as we get close to God, as we become more holy, to recognize that holiness is not like, a, you know, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not an ATM, right? It's not, you put in, you get out, right? There's a certain standard that gets held us to that is beyond us, that is greater than us. Um, and that, that's the challenge here. Um, and David is too familiar with it, right? And what does David do, just to prove this a little bit more, what does David do later on? He still dances, he still has the joy, but every six steps, they bring a sacrifice, right? They recognize that they need to bring this sacrifice to God. There's this, there's this constant reset every six steps to make sure people have the right mind space. A sacrifice in those times isn't just like a, a meal, right? A sacrifice recognizes, especially if we understand the Ramban, Nachmanides, that sacrifice is supposed to be vicarious sacrifice. You're supposed to look on this animal and see that you should have died instead of this animal. So, right, that's a very sombering moment every six steps, right? And so what David goes to solve is this lack of familiarity. Why is Uzzah punished for this? Maybe he grew up too long with the Aron. 
and it's too too familiar to him. Maybe it's the Yushalmi, that's this outrageous idea that he relieved himself in front of the Aron. And what's interesting even is, if you look, Rav Moshe Lichtenstein, in his analysis of our Torah, makes this point. If you look, we said there are two brothers. There's Uza and Achio, right? And they're supposed to walk together. They're, they're, they're the honor guard, right, on either side, right, of the Aron. And what happens? It seems in the next verse, they start out side by side, but by the end, Achio goes before the Aron. And Ramosha points out, Ramosha points out that he has this moment where he understands the Aron's not just an object. The Aron represents the divine encounter and, and God. And therefore he can't walk side by side with the Aron. So Achio has this rec religious recognition and therefore he moves his position in relation to the Aron to be in front of it. So essentially escort it, but not walk side by side by it. Whereas Uzzah is not, does not have that recognition. Again, it's 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 a it's a it's a tenuous textual point. Yeah, Renana. Uh, no, I just want to say that that before David decides that he has got to be much more careful, much more reverent, if you will, he's angry with God. It says that that he was very very upset that David. It says David was displeased because the Lord had broken forth upon Uzzah, and yeah. I thought that was interesting because in comparison to the Parsha, Aaron does not get upset with God, or at least it doesn't seem that he's upset when his sons are killed. Yes. And David breaks down the whole procession, whereas yeah. in our, in our have to in three months pause, whereas in the Torah, it does not. So it's definitely a point of contrast. Um, and that just highlights this question, right? At least by Nadav Avihu, there seems to be this religious, outburst of fervor without limits that is almost understood that it was a problem whereas for Uza it's very it's very perplexing David ultimately finds a reason you know and he takes responsibility for it part of that's why he makes him such a good Jewish leader right he's a he's a leader that's able to take responsibility for their mistakes right um, I mean no political comment there except I wish all of our leaders would be able to do that um, but that's what makes David so great. Um, and uh, and that, that story up here. So that's, that's the second, that's the second, the third reason, or maybe it was Uzzah that he was supposed to have known this Midrash that the other was supposed to carry the people, or maybe it was in the, the wagon. All of these are different options, right? Too close, too familiar. He relieved himself in front of the Aron, which might be an out, verse, uh, an out, an out a byproduct of that. Um, it was, should never have been on the wagon in the first place. It was the wrong way of carrying it, like the Gemara in, 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 in Sota describes. But then why is Uzzah punished and not David? Um, it seems like a lot of people around David get punished for David's answers, for David's mistakes, right? Um, Naval and, uh, and uh, by, uh, blanking on her name, Bacheva's husband, um, Uriah, right? There seems to be people dying for David's sins. Maybe it's because David's such an important character. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question um, to think about. And, or number four, um, it, it, it sh he should have known that the Aron was gonna carry itself and therefore it would never fall. Again, maybe it was just a reflux. So here I have another, a fifth answer, a fifth answer. Um, and this is from Rabbi Alan Schwartz. Does anyone know of Rabbi Alan Schwartz? He's the rabbi of OZ of, uh, I don't remember what it stands for, in New York City. Um, he teaches at YU at, at Revel. He's an unbelievable ta uh, Tanakh scholar, um, a really brilliant uh, thinker. He has a number of books. So I saw that he writes, and he says this very tentatively, and he says this recognizing the challenge that we all have right now, like what happens here? How could this be so bad? And what happens? Think about, you know, think about uh, Avi Nadav. He holds the Aron for, I think it's 23 years, right? He holds the Aron for 23 years and takes care of it and everything. And finally, they bring it to Shalayim, and on that day, he gets repaid by losing his son, right? Like that's, that's what happens. What happens here? What happens here, right? So he answers, he suggests the, this very tentative, very tentative reading, and I will save, preface it the way he prefaces it, asking Mechila, asking forgiveness from Uzzah for trying to find a mistake in Uzzah for this. But if you look at the text, he makes a very interesting uh, thing. What should the text say? What should the text say? 
that the arm started to fall and Uzzah grabbed it, right? That is cause and effect. But what mm -hmm. does the text say? If you look in verse number uh, six, they get to this place, Vaishlach Uzzah El Aaron Hashem, and he grabs it and it shifts because on the, on the, because the cow shifts. What he wants to claim is that Uzzah wants to be a hero here. He wants, uh, all the people are here and he, 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 he but nothing's happening. But well, he's supposed to be here to safeguard the Aaron. The Aaron's totally fine. And so he essentially describes it as the Munchausen syndrome by proxy, right? He tries to jolt the Aaron and be a hero. Um, and save the Aaron then, and he'll be the savior of the Jewish people. We know what happens if the Aaron isn't treated properly, but God knows all, and no one can trick God, and God smites him for that, for that, uh, for that hubris at that moment, that arrogance to try to be the hero. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting way of dealing with a textual anomaly, um, and it definitely then gives him a certain uh, culpability. He's not innocent then, um, and he's less innocent than some of the other things that we've seen. Um, it does feel a little bit like EO, where all his friends try to figure out what he did wrong. So maybe that's not the best way, but it's an interesting interpretation. So there are that that's another interpretation here. So let's uh, let's 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 close this out um, and 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 uh, sort and, and 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 bring that together. So number one, and maybe answer some of our first questions. Number one, we have this whole story, clearly the comparison between the two brothers, the celebration marred by tragedy is unescapable, right? The connection. There are differences and similarities, but, but we definitely see how these Haftarot and Parsha are paired. The theme that seems to be brought is this need to be super careful around our, the Aron, right? That one of the bounds that we think about, one of the poles of the experience of the Jew as we try to draw close to God, is this recognition of Eish Ochla, that God is inapproachable in some way. And that as much as we try to come close to God, there needs to be this, it needs to be saturated with this fear and this restraint. And there's that two step between the joy, the dancing, but also bringing up the dancing every six steps for a Ola, for a sacrifice to try to reset that. And that's the balance that they weren't able to capture. And that's what they get moving forward. What was Uzzah's exact sin? We gave a number of different interpretations, including this rather radical one by uh, Rabbi Alan Schwartz, um, which I think is interestingly textually. Uh, and that might then tie in to some of the other questions. Why does, what is the role of Michal's conversation with David afterwards in verse uh, 20 through 23? Maybe that's part of the challenge here of Shaul. That, that Shaul holds himself up, right? And if you remember when we read the stories of Shaul, particularly his downfall, he's so looking to be that revered figure for the people, whereas David is able to put everything on the line, both to call his mistakes, but to be before God, he recognizes he's nothingness, right? He's nothing. Um, and therefore, he, uh, before, therefore, that's sort of why David is chosen and Shaul is not. Um, and then that also ties in maybe into the, this next part, this broader question of why do we build, why do we talk about building the, the Beit HaMikdash here? Um, maybe it's because, uh, maybe it doesn't connect, or maybe, you know, it's because there is some connection here about David's humility or the role of finding a place for, for the Aron that is obviously uh, more in line with our Parsha, which is all about building the, is not just about the Aron, but the whole Mishkan. I'm not sure. But uh, it's definitely food for thought and something that we could discuss uh, at a different year of the, the second part of our Haftorah here about why Ashkenazim, we add it. Um, of course, we did suggest one very technical answer to get to 32, thir to get through to 21 verses. We need to add a few more verses. We don't want to just talk about the Michal story, which is very negative. And so we add in the next section, which is the first 17 verses of the next chapter. Um, but you know, we've seen already how Torahs aren't always 21 verses. So it's hard to say that that's the, the definitive reason why that is. So we'll stop here. Um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be able to discuss this at a future time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.